Illinois faces some big challenges. Today, you're about to hear a truly honest analysis of the problems we face. Equally important, you'll also hear an in-depth discussion of some practical solutions. This is your radio source for stories, the insight, and the answers you won't hear anywhere else. Not on the media, and not coming from Springfield. You're listening to Illinois Rising, presented by the Illinois Opportunity Project. Now, here's your host, AM 560's Dan Proft. Welcome to another edition of Illinois Rising. I'm Dan Proft, co-host of Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560, weekdays 5 to 9 a.m. with Amy Jacobson. Joining me on this installment is Ted Dabrowski, who is the president of WirePoints.com. WirePoints.com, you want to read that website every day for great policy content on Illinois uh, policies such as they are, Illinois quality of life issues that are or not being addressed by the General Assembly and the established political order mostly not being addressed. And uh, Ted, uh, Illinois made history thanks to Mark Janice's courage and Pam Harris's courage before <laughs> him, Harris v. Quinn, uh, and the Liberty Justice Center uh, and the Illinois Policy Institute, which... Uh, Liberty Justice Center providing much of the legal representation for Mark Janus. A 5-4 decision on Wednesday, the Supreme Court held, well, in Justice Alito's words, the First Amendment is violated when money is taken from non-consenting employees for a public sector union. Employees must choose to support the union before anything is taken from them, uh, meaning uh, no more fair share extractions in 22 states and the District of Columbia, including Illinois. And uh, the, uh, one of the lawyers, in addition to Pat Hughes, friend of the show and sometimes co-host, one of the lawyers in the case is Jacob Hubert from the Liberty Justice Center who joins us now. Jacob, thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Sure. Thanks for having me. So uh, it's an exciting time. I mean, this uh, essentially overturns uh, a, the Abood case, which has stood for four decades and give us your impression of uh, what this means legally for kind of the new reality on the ground in Illinois. Well, what this means is that every government worker, whether at the state level, the local level, public schools, whatever, now has the choice as to whether they're going to give any money at all to a union. Uh, And that's true in Illinois, and it's also true across the country. Now, it, I read uh, one opinion on SCOTUS blog, um, a response, uh, not from a justice, but from an interested party, Alice O'Brien, who is the general counsel for the National Education Association, Teachers Union. She uh, writes that uh, rather than precedent or principle, what appears to drive the Janus majority is barely concealed animus toward public sector unions and their advocacy. That uh, the fact is this Janus majority opinion is not about expanding the f- the uh, speech rights of public employees at all. It is about five justices constitutionalizing their disdain for the right of working people to come together to speak with a unified and strong voice. How do you react to that rhetoric? Well, that gets it completely backwards. It's the unions that aren't interested in talking about the First Amendment because they know that issue is directly against them. Uh, it's, It's beyond dispute that Across the board, the First Amendment does not allow the government to force people to subsidize a private organization's political advocacy. And these unions had this strange exception that made no sense that the court has now gotten rid of. So this case is all about the First Amendment, but they don't want to talk about that because they lose on that, as in fact they did lose on that. What they do instead want to do is make it about politics because that's what it's about for them. They've had this privilege for decades where they've been able to force people to subsidize their political advocacy and give them an unfair advantage in policy debates at the state level in Illinois and uh, at lots of other levels of government. And so, of course, they're very upset about this. Of course, they don't want to talk about the real issue. And so they try to make it about uh, their politics, and they're mad because they think this is going to hurt their uh, policy agenda. Yeah, you know, the the left is very good at projecting. Um, They've uh, honed that craft very well. It was interesting. I uh, spoke with Mark Janis on my morning show this past Thursday, and it was and I asked him what I thought was you know sort of a tongue in cheek question. So what are you going to do? Are you going to opt in or not now, now that you're free to choose your own course? And he said, you know what, um, we'll see what the union offers. He said, I'm, I've got an open mind. If if uh, 
AFSME offers to, if, if they show evidence of sort of reforming themselves internally, if they offer me a good deal, I mean, I'll consider it. So, you know, the, all of the rhetoric about union busters and billionaire union busters and the like, and Mark Janice is telling you, you know, I'm, he's not ideological. It's not anti-union. I'm open-minded, but I want to be able to think for myself and decide for myself. That's right. This whole idea that it's an attack on workers coming together and organizing and things like that is just a lie because, of course, they can still organize and unions can still represent workers. They can do all the things they've always done. They just can't force dissenters to pay for it. Jacob, I think a, a lot of people have a those people who aren't following the case closely and uh, you know, may not have a clear understanding of how a person like Mark Janice's money is being used. Uh, you know, a lot of people think it's just used for collective bargaining and for, you know, getting a higher raise and all that. Uh, but we know that in Illinois, behind virtually every fiscal problem and, and some moral problems, we just uh, we know there's a lot of problems in Illinois. Uh, behind a lot of those problems is a union. And so can, can you explain to people how how it is that that these monies are then used? They may not be going to politics, but how is it hurting Mark Janice's First Amendment rights? Well, everything these public sector unions do is political. When they're bargaining with the government on workers' behalf, they're telling the government things like how much it should pay workers, what kind of pension benefits it should provide, how it should run its programs. Of course, these are all political topics. When anybody else talks to the government about these things, everyone recognizes that as political, and we call it lobbying. And, of course, recently in Illinois, uh, I mean, AFSCME's political influence through its collective bargaining is well known. And in their recent collective bargaining, they even advocated uh, to have the governor join with them in uh, promoting tax increases. Well, of course, that's political. And if Mark Janice opposes these things, as indeed he does, then he's being forced to pay for political speech that he disagrees with. And that's something the First Amendment pretty much never allows. Yeah. And it's interesting to know, too, I mean, just in terms of how political they are and uh, on which side of the line they generally fall. Uh, we did a story of Prairie State Wire, uh, prairiestatewire.com, uh, looking at just the donations from AFSCME, which was the union that uh, Mark Janice had previously been forced to be a part of. Just the uh, donations from AFSCME in calendar year 2018, so the first six months of this year, $398,000 to Democrats, $9,000 to Republicans. So, you know, 98% to Democrats and the Democrat power structure here, which has served uh, where, where they have served each other so well. So you understand there's a lot to risk, but it, and, and all of that relates to maintaining the political status quo. That's right. I mean, it's about maintaining the status quo, except to make have more spending and more taxes to pay for it. Uh, consistently, that's what we see in Illinois. You know, I, I would add one more thing, too, um, that, you know, the, the way they use their their monies, right, when it's not political donations, it's, uh, you know, they're arguing for things like attacking a, a particular industry, for example, like making the, the f finance industry, LaSalle Street taxes, right? They're targeting a particular industry. $15 or, minimum wage. Yeah, right. minimum wage, right. So they're hurting companies. They're, uh, they're targeting uh, the, the people with higher incomes to pay even more taxes. So it's, uh, it's deeply, deeply political. That's right. And you see that, like, for example, uh, people who are teachers, are for, many are forced to give money to the National Education Association, and they turn around and use that for policy advocacy that has nothing to do with representing workers, but just includes a, a broad progressive agenda that we know large percentage of teachers don't actually support. Uh, now, uh, CMS, the Central Management Services, sent out a letter on Wednesday after the decision was handed down, sort of advising state workers uh, of the, 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 the new legal regime under which they operate or, or can, you know, how they can opt in and, and or just, uh, choose to stay opted out of the union per per the Janus decision. How long is it going to be before we're going to get some sense, do you think, of the impact of this decision in terms of the membership of unions, the balance of power on the ground? Uh, do, do you have any sense of that? I don't have a good sense of that. I think it's going to vary a lot by state. I think some states are going to make it relatively easy for workers to not be union members anymore if they already are or to or, or not do anything to try to, to uh, trap workers, but then some states are going to enact things in the law to make it very difficult to get out once you're in. And uh, unions are going to come up with lots of tricks to get people to join in and putting up lots of barriers to stop people from getting out. And so it's going to take, and that's going to require more litigation. 
So the Janus case is really only the beginning in a way, because I think there's going to be a lot more legal fights. So uh, I don't think you'll see the, the full ramifications of Janus for some time to come. Uh, Jacob, yesterday uh, or the other day at Wirepoints, we put out a piece about, you know, it was really important that the case before the Supreme Court was based on Illinois, uh, because Illinois' unions have been so coercive and so powerful at, at basically destroying the finances of the state. And so I argue that that made it really crystal clear as to how the unions across the country, but in particular Illinois, use their power and, and, and destroy First Amendment rights. So the question is going to be, you know, you've, t- you've covered the nation in, in, this, uh, in this ruling, but uh, how do you think this plays out in Illinois? And, and I guess the question really is, is how does this affect collective bargaining powers that the unions have? Well, in Illinois, the governor has announced that anybody who's not a member automatically will not have any more money coming out of their paycheck, so that's good. And it looks like the state is going to make it very easy for people who are already members to opt out immediately if that's what they want to do. So that's good. As for the actual effect on collective bargaining, I mean, it won't directly affect that uh, in as much as the union still has the power to to bargain collectively. uh, And I'm sure they'll continue to advocate for the sort of things they've advocated for in the past. But at least they won't have outsized resources to push this agenda, not only through collective bargaining, but through all the other things they try to do to change policy. He is Jacob Hubert, Director of Litigation for the Liberty Justice Center, who represented Mark Janus before the Supreme Court in Janus v. AFSCME. We'll remember that case for, well, for for all time now. It is a part of Supreme Court uh, uh, jurisprudence. Jacob, thanks for joining us. Congratulations on the victory. Congratulations. Thank you, and thanks for having me.